and welcome to this episode of Retro Game Living Room. Today's episode isn't a video, it's a podcast. This is my interview with former Sega of America CEO Tom Kalinske discussing his time at Mattel, at Sega, and beyond. This was originally the R Retro Gaming Podcast. It was broadcast in 2015 on SoundCloud. We've since had hosting problems on SoundCloud, so I'm moving those interviews to YouTube. Enjoy this interview in which Tom revealed first-time information that Sega had considered releasing the 3DO interactive multiplayer and the Nintendo Virtual Boy before it went to Nintendo. Tom also discusses other projects that could have been made instead of Sega Saturn and gives his thoughts on Dreamcast. Stick around. Exciting special guest, Tom Kalinsky, who was the CEO of Sega of America during the Genesis era. Uh, Tom, before we get started, is there anything in particular that you want to talk about? Well, no, I'm I'm uh, I'm open to any questions. I think it's great you guys are keeping uh, interest in in uh, video games and particularly some of the retro games alive and have people conversing about them still. And of course, it's it's fun for me to talk about uh, the book Console Wars and the upcoming documentary and hope and the hopeful feature film that people are working on. Yeah, and the book is fantastic. We both just read it. Good. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's great. I mean, I couldn't put it down. Man, it really they made it come in a way that it sort of like was very narrative. You know, you really felt like you were on the ground floor at Sega. You felt like you were in there with the team, you know, and you were just leading the whole way. And, I mean, you guys had so much adversity as a company. Yeah. It seemed like, it seemed like everybody was, like, it seems like seems like a movie trailer. All the odds were against you. Yeah, yeah. But there well, that, you go. You, you flipped the company, and you made it super successful. Well, that's you why know? we had to be different. We, you know, mm-hmm. we had to be very different from Nintendo in every way that we possibly could, whether that meant we treated third-party publishers better than they did and had better uh, of course we had to have better royalty rates or licensing rates because they were so dominant or or we treated retailers better than they did uh tried to treat consumers better i am you know they were pretty good at that as well and uh, you know go after a different audience we just had to be very different from them so in the book it seems like you're brand new to video games when you've come to sega so you're at mattel that was your that's where your career started and then Matchbox for a while, and then it seems like you took a break, and then all of a sudden Sega. But I was wondering because uh, Mattel had in television at the same time that you were there, which yeah. was the second most popular video game system of its of the second generation. Yeah. Did you have any in- with either the Intellivision or the handheld electronics? Yes, I did. Um, so uh, when we were working on uh, handheld uh, handheld electronics came first, and that was actually in my uh, group, uh, yeah, I was I was at the time I think senior VP of of all of all product marketing and uh, and product development, and so we had a group working on the handheld products. Uh, gee, Mike Katz was involved in that, yeah. and uh, and then um, oh gosh, what was his name? Uh, Richard Chang, down in R and D, brilliant, brilliant guy. And so I mean, you, those things were pretty rudimentary, and and again, you talk about adversity, so. Richard suggests we do these handhelds and you've got little LED lights uh, on a small screen and you're trying to play football, but wait a minute, it's only like uh, seven people, seven dots on the screen on each side, or you're doing uh, a racing game and it's just uh, LEDs running around. Uh, you know, they were pretty pretty simple products, but we decided that uh, at Mattel we needed to go after uh, not just young kids, but let's go after a little older audience. So initially... You may not remember this, but we launched handheld games for 
Father's Day as a Father's Day present. And uh, it turned out it was very successful. And so we continued developing handhelds. Well, then Richard Chang and other guys down in R&D came up with the idea of in, in television trying to be a little bit better than, than Atari. Well, at that point, the handheld electronic business had grown sizably. Was, and and the, the CEO of the company and the board of directors at the time, a guy named Bob Anderson was CEO, and the board decided that they would separate this from the toy division and make it its own separate Mattel electronics division. Well, you can imagine I was a little miffed at that. Uh, and they physically moved everybody down the street on Rosecrans Avenue in Hawthorne, California to another building. So they really separated us and we didn't have any contact with them anymore. And so I kind of, uh, I was, I was frankly very annoyed about that because I thought, geez, we started this whole thing and now they, they, they took the business away. And as you can imagine, years later, we're growing Barbie and, and Ma Masters of the Universe and Hot Wheels and things are going great for the toy division. And all of a sudden I start hearing from retailers that Atari's uh, in trouble and Intellivision's in trouble and there's too much product at retail and it's not selling through and the software's not selling through. And of course, Atari made the horrible mistake on E.T., uh, where not only was it a lousy game, but I think they made more cartridges than hardware systems existed, which is kind of unusual. And uh, so I start reporting this back to the chairman and the CEO of, of Mattel, Bob Anderson and, and uh, uh, Art Spear. And they say, that, that you know, that's nice. Just go pay attention to the toy business. We know what we're doing here with, with uh, Jeff Rockless and, uh, and Ed Krakauer and the and the uh, Mattel Electronics business. Don't worry about that. We're taking care of that. Well, then you know what happened. I mean, the year that everything crashed, literally probably six months after I started having those conversations. Unfortunately, at the same time, all the other Mattel subsidiaries had a bad year too. So, you know, Western Publishing, Ringling Brothers Barn and Bailey Circus, uh, Optagon Oregon, Metaframe, which was a tubular steel company. Don't ask me why we own that. Uh, pet supply company, um, audio tape manufacturing company, everything went to hell. The only thing that didn't was the toy business. So that's when I became CEO. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so it's kind you of pick, interesting. You picked the everybody right says, one. Everybody says, well, you didn't know anything about the electronics business or, or uh, video games. I knew a little. Uh, yeah. And, and of course, I, I left and went and, uh, and built Matchbox and took it public. And and then we sold it, and that's when I was on vacation, and that's when Hayao Nakayama came out and, and rousted me off a beach to get me go look at 16-bit technology. But that, that, the, the thing that was so dramatic to me was, of course, I was familiar with the old Atari games and with Intellivision. I wasn't that familiar with uh, NES, although at Matchbox we did do a one Matchbox game through a, I don't remember which developer we used, so I had a little experience in, in dealing with Nintendo there, uh, but uh, but the difference in quality between what I was used to in, in television and early Atari and 16-bit was so dramatic. You can imagine why when I went to Japan and saw that, that I was so taken by it. Because it was certainly, it wasn't just a, I wasn't, again, not that familiar with 8-bit, so it wasn't to me a step up from 8-bit. It was a step up from Intellivision and Atari, and what a step it was. I mean, talk about an enormous difference. Sure, I would imagine it would be like waking up from a coma in 1985 and then seeing Xbox 360 or Xbox yeah. One today. I, yeah, I, that's, that's a great analogy. I had no idea that you were involved in uh, the early Mattel handheld, so... For our listeners, Auto Race was released in 1977 by Mattel Electronics, and it's the very first handheld. So, Tom, you basically invented or helped to invent the handheld video game market way back in. Well, it, it, and again, though, remember, I was I was in senior management then, so it was the guys in product management and and product development R and D that really invented these things and had the foresight to say, "Hey, somebody's going to be interested in playing this. It's better than you know the the." typical games, the board games or physical games that existed at the time. And we're going to be able to get dads to play it and older uh, teens and college kids to play it. So that was the, 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 the vision that those guys had back in the, the late 70s that was so uh, incredible when you think about it coming out of, out of a, a toy company. So 
you already knew by the t- when you got to Sega that you that it was a good idea to go after an older gaming crowd. Well, I did, but I also knew Nintendo owned the younger age group, and so there really wasn't. It would be a much harder battle if we went after the same audiences as, as they did. And so again, I you know I, I felt very certain that we had to appeal to an, an older age group and and be more. Uh, uh, aggressive toward that that marketplace and and do games that were more in keeping with their interests and and yes uh, and 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 be uh, more edgy and uh, even more violent. Now that brings up a couple of things. Before I go into the violent part, I definitely we definitely want to cover parts of that. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Mike Katz earlier, and so Mike Katz, you worked with at Mattel, and then before you came to Sega, you actually took his job. He was the CEO well, of Sega before you. Yeah, it actually, in, in title, it wasn't quite correct. He was actually president of oh. Sega of America. And so they brought me in as CEO of Sega of America. And they they being Sega Japan. Right. And Naki, Nakayama was not a fan of, of Mike. Uh, and it was a difficult thing for me because Mike and I were friends. Mike and I had uh, not not just because he worked for me long ago at Mattel, but we were also tennis friends. We I used to play a lot of tennis, and we would play against each other in, in tennis uh, uh, even after you know we were both out of Mattel. So uh, it was a very difficult situation for me to come in and and then have to be literally his boss as CEO, and then eventually have to uh, uh, let him go or ask him to to leave. I can't imagine how difficult that would be. Yeah, very hard. Like, like, especially with, you know, playing tennis with someone, a big part of it is you kind of have to be in that other person's mind a lot. Yeah. So, like, yeah, I could see how that would be very difficult to sort of have to make those calls when you know maybe how he's going to react because you've been practicing doing it on a different yeah. plane, you yeah. know, so. Well, I and I still have a lot of respect for him, by the way. I mean, I think a lot of obviously the work he did very early on at Mattel was was terrific, and then you know the the pioneering work he did for Sega of America, uh, you, you know, was also very good. A lot of it was very good. He, he he's the guy who went out and got the contract, uh, and, or at least started the discussions with Joe Montana, for example, which uh, turned out to be a, a a really good move. Yeah, and he did the big Sega does what Nintendo don't advertising campaign, which yeah. we're, everyone's familiar with. So what do you think it was about Mike's style that Sega Japan didn't like, and how is it different from yours? <laughs> well, there were a couple of other things, too, though. Mike had a, a hard time, other than the marketing decisions, he had a hard time with some of the other decision-making in the company. He hadn't really run a... A business before so i think that was that was difficult for him and then i think the the fatal error he made was he he didn't like sonic the hedgehog <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't go over very well uh but stylistically i think uh i got along with the soj people sega japan people and management and certainly with hayao nakayama a lot better than mike did and part of that, I think, is just, you know, personality and the and, uh, way you deal with people. Uh, I've always been, you know, the Japanese culture, uh, uh, I've always been very respectful of their culture and of the way they, uh, that, you, that you treat people who are, who are in uh, important positions uh, or who are older. And I'm not sure Mike quite got that. Speaking of Sonic and your relationship with Sega of Japan, there's, there's a, a part in the book where I think you, you're coming to them and you're saying, now listen, Sonic's not going to work in the West the way it was originally presented to you. Yeah. And um, I believe they're, they're like, no, we don't want to change it. Yeah. And then Nakayama puts his fists on the desk and says, no, I trust you, Tom. That's why I hired you, because yeah. I trust you. Now, just I don't know if you recall that moment or if it was embellished for the book or not. I don't know what... Uh, actually transpired but how was that originally when you were discussing sonic and how it would work in the west or not um at that point what was the relationship like with sega japan because i can imagine that it was it was a lot to to translate how this is a different taste you know yeah well he he of course supported me a number of times in in that manner uh the in the in the in the 
sonic situation, you'll recall from the book originally, and you saw pictures, I think, in the book, Sonic mm -hmm. was originally uh, uh, much more aggressive looking, had fangs. Uh, the spikes were extremely sharp. There were, he was very much more uh, angular. He had this busty girlfriend named Madonna. We couldn't have gotten away with that, I don't think. And he had a rock band. <laughs> and, uh, and so we asked them to get rid of the uh, rock band and Madonna and to obviously make him not have huge fangs so he looked very aggressive and and angry but to make him cooler and uh and uh, but but still obviously a, a, a pretty uh uh out there character i mean you want him to be approachable guy. though yeah we want him you to know? be approachable we basically what i said was we want him to be the the smart ass almost teenager that uh everybody really loves even though he he gets away with murder half the time you mm. know and so that was kind of the character we wanted. And Al Nielsen really had – Al had a great way of dealing with the, these kinds of issues. I mean he could weave a story about why Sonic had to be the way we wanted him, but better than anybody. Uh, and I think late, uh, later in the book when he was dealing with uh, Naka on some Sonic issues, he, he actually almost got Naka to cry over oh, his yeah, the, description of how important uh, – Yeah, the tales thing. over miles, right? Yeah, that yeah, tails over miles per hour. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you, and by the way, I think, I think that was my one contribution to the whole Sega family was I remember early on saying he needed a friend and it, and it should be an echidna. And that, of course, is uh, was one of the other characters. In the, in the, and it in becomes Knuckles. Where did you come up with yeah. an echidna from? That was, because when I was a kid, I had never heard of an echidna before. Probably most American kids hadn't either. And now they're a famous animal. Yeah, you know why I did? Because I was looking uh, through literally a dictionary or an encyclopedia on hedgehogs, and somehow the Echidna character came up relatively close to the hedgehog. And so that was why. I think you were copied eventually by Naughty Dog when they launched Crash Bandicoot, which is another obscure yeah. Australian marsupial. Um, so when you guys were doing that, it was uh, Madeline Schroeder who was, doing the, who was leading the redesign of the character. Is that right. correct? That's so correct. The, the, the fact that she was a woman and that Japanese culture is more male-dominated add any more to like the conflict between Sega of America and Sega of Japan in that? Well, that's a really good question. I, I don't know if it added to the conflict. And, and by the way, I think at that time she was actually Madeline Canapa. She hadn't married Bert Schroeder yet, who also worked for us and was a, a producer, great producer of video games. Um uh, I, I think what happened is they she would go over and they just didn't they weren't used to dealing with a strong female who had very strong views. So they'd get real quiet around her and they wouldn't make a decision or a comment too much. They'd wait until we were alone without uh, without her being in the room before they'd really open up and express their feelings to us. But anyway, you were correct in your starting point uh, after Nakayama heard the both sides of the discussion, how the. Uh, SOJ guys didn't want to change the character and they wanted to keep Madonna and they wanted to keep the band. Uh, Nakayama put his fist down and said, no, we're going to do what, uh, what Sega of America wants to do, what Tom wants to do. That's good. And it seems like them letting you do what you want to do is what led to the success that Sega had in the United States during the 16-bit generation. Well, I think it was more uh, also, you know, the famous meeting where I presented the, the four point plan on what we what we wanted to do in America. And those points were, of course, lowering the price of the of the hardware, taking Altered Beast out of the out of the hardware bundle, putting Sonic the Hedgehog in, which they really hated because they knew that would be the loss of a potential forty dollar profitable software cartridge, uh, you know, including in the hardware. You don't get that margin for it. So. Uh, and, and then going after the older audience they didn't like and going after uh, Nintendo and making fun of Nintendo, they really hated, thought that was ridiculous. And then they were fearful of hiring a lot of people in Redwood City and, and uh, developing games internally inside of Sega of America and also, of course, using a network of producers and developers and third-party developers on the outside to support Sega in America. They were uncomfortable with they were uncomfortable with all of this and that that once again, you know, they discussed for almost an hour and nobody agreed and Nakayama didn't agree. But as he 
left the room, he literally turned and said, okay, nobody agrees with anything you said, but go ahead and do it. Uh, uh, I, that's why I hired you. And so that was the, that was the reason we were successful in the United States. We were, we were allowed to do the plan that we had developed. If Sega of Japan had followed your lead and, and took your four bullet points, do you think that they would, that Genesis or Mega Drive would have done better in its home territory? In Japan? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I think the mistake they made was they just tried to do everything that Nintendo did the same way that Nintendo did in, in Japan. And they never really built much of a bit. I don't think they ever got over a 10% share in, in maybe they got a little bit more, more than that, but not much in, in Japan. So what was, what was, what was, what, what's holding them back? So they're seeing you're starting to win in America and you keep winning and Genesis is doing so well that at one point you have 54% of the market share. So why is Sega in Japan not following this lead? This is one of the great mysteries to me. And by the way, it's something that I failed to see while I was at Sega. I didn't realize the animosity that was building up in the middle management ranks in marketing and product development and, and all of management at Sega of Japan toward Sega of America because of our success. It just never occurred to me and until too late. Uh, and, and, and basically what I now understand happened was every Monday morning, Nakayama would walk into the decision room where the middle management and senior management of the company is and beat the hell out of everybody about uh, how come you're not as successful as they are in the United States or for that matter, and as they are in UK. And, you know, after a while, every Monday you get yelled at and the tables pounded in front of you and you're told how stupid you are. You start to really dislike these people who are, are being successful. That didn't occur to me. And, and what started to happen was as those middle managers rose up inside the organization, they had a real antipathy toward, toward Sega of America and, uh, and uh, didn't want to cooperate. They, in a sense, wanted, I, what I was told was they wanted us to fail. And that's not a great thing. I mean, that's a no, pretty that, That's never thing. good. Especially when you're on the same team. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that that uh, disconnect between Sega of America and Sega Japan is s sort of like the hot button issue that sort of has led the company to where it is today? Do you think that uh, going out of hardware and all these future things that happened way after your time is sort of a result of the two companies not being able to really see eye to eye? Well, I, it's probably more complicated than that because after the Sega Sammy merger, mm -hmm. the, the, the Sammy part of the business was so profitable in the pachinko business and in other entertainment venues and i think they even have golf courses and resorts and what have you that part of the business started being so important and the video game business became less important it was easy to see why the then and new management of, of sega which was largely from the sammy company satomi san and and his son would would uh, not pay as much attention to the to the video game business it hadn't been successful in Japan. That's the that's where they live. That's what they understood. They see that it's not successful there. They don't see the United States all that that well or or clearly. Uh, and at that by that time, Sega wasn't that successful in the United States. Dreamcast had uh, pretty much uh, was on the decline. So it was easy to see why they don't uh, didn't put the resources behind keeping Sega of America uh, important. I mean, from my standpoint, of course, this was a mistake. Even if you get out of the hardware business, there's so much great Sega IP. You could have remained a powerful uh, more publisher more on other platforms through today. You could be. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really, to me, that I just don't understand it. I don't understand why they walked away from the market and all this great IP they have. And, and certainly there's enough talented people in the United States where we could have taken that, that IP and turned it into great games on PlayStation and, X, and Xbox and even, obviously, in Nintendo where they now have a relationship. So, you know, to me that was a, a mistake and one I, I don't understand. Yeah, I think your bewilderment is almost universal. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, we all feel the exact same way. So, yeah. Um, it seems so obvious, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, to, me, to me, it just seems so obvious that uh, I don't get it. So you said that you didn't see this coming when it was happening. In hindsight, if you detected this animosity between the two divisions of Sega, do you think there's something you could have done to fix it before it erupted? That's a great question. Uh, 
I, I don't know, but I think I would have tried. I don't know if I would have been able to to fix it, but I, as I, I've reflected on this quite a bit, and I thought that one of my mistakes, first of all, I wasn't persuade. Apparently, wasn't persuasive enough in a number of issues. I wasn't, you know, obviously Nakayama started to listen more to his management team than to me, and I wasn't persuasive enough to get the combination of a Sega Sonic, excuse me, a Sony, a Sony. Sega hardware platform done. Uh, I should have been able to convince them to do that, and I wasn't. And that, to me, was a mistake on my part, and certainly a mistake on on their part. And then, and then, uh, if I had known about this animosity growing inside the company, instead of maintaining my very strong relationship through the years up until the end with Nakayama, I would have tried to build the relationship better at the middle ranks of management in Japan. And I didn't, I didn't do that as well as I, as I should have apparently. So let's, let's go back to the violence a little bit. You said you had to be a little bit more violent in the book. Um, you're portrayed as being hesitant. Like this is something that's like weighing on you that you, that you don't want to do this. So how, how is that? And then you created the VRC, the video game rating council, which led obviously to the ESRB that we have today. Yeah. So what, what was that process? Yeah, and so no, you're right. You, the book actually re- reports this very accurately. I, I was very troubled by this, but yet I saw this enormous opportunity with Mortal Kombat, where if we portrayed the game the way it was originally designed, with the the blood that's in the arcade machines, that we would be uh, considered more realistic and uh, more appealing to those folks who were older that loved it in the in the arcades. And at the same time, I was troubled by it, so that's why I wanted us to do a, a rating system. And I don't know, I can't remember if in the book it describes, I actually initially went to uh, Jack Valente, who was running the Motion Picture Association at the time. And of course, the Motion Picture Association has had the rating system that they've used for many, 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 many years. And I tried to get Jack to let us use the Motion Picture association rating system and to even uh, get them involved in rating our our games because i thought hey it works for the movie industry right yeah plus everyone knows it yeah, yeah everybody knows it so no the we, hardest part so is, is educating that people. and the analogy is gee there's disney movies for young kids and there's r-rated movies for adults so why not for video games and and for me to me that that made all the all the sense in the world but i obviously i couldn't get jack to agree to that uh he didn't want to have anything to do with the video game business hmm. uh He's dead now, of course, but if I bet he's turning over in his grave that the video game business is far larger than the movie business today. So the VRC, when you created it, this is about the same time that you're going through the hearings over Night Trap on Sega CD and Mortal Kombat. Actually, no, we, we had the rating system done well before that. Right. Uh, uh, so, But anyway, it was yeah, I was in place at, at that time, yeah. How do you feel that those hearings affected Sega and the gaming industry as a whole? Well, I think, and by the way, I, I was, before the hearings, trying to get everyone in the industry to use a rating system. Uh, I was very open about that. I, you know, I wrote a passionate letter to Nintendo to try to get them to use a rating system. Uh, um, Sony was still only then not a hardware maker, but a, a software developer. They were agreeing to come along on it. EA agreed very shortly uh, uh, thereafter. So most of the people were coming on board, except for, of course, Nintendo, who right. said we didn't need such a thing. Um, so I was making pretty good progress about the time that the hearing started. The The one big difference was we formed the, the ESA, and everybody said, well, gee, it, it can't just be the Sega rating system. <laughs> it's got to be the ESA. So so, you know, they used the same guy, Dr. Arthur Pover, and uh, we had some PhDs in sociology and child psychology and and uh, other disciplines on the board of the rating the rating board. And they, they used most of the same ones. I think they added a few, but they used most of the same ones and developed a little more detailed, I would say, rating system. But it really was based on the on the Sega rating system and the same people were running the the rating board that were there that I put in place. But anyway, uh, it, then the hearings, I think what ha- happened there was actually, as it turns out, it ended up being good for the industry because it made the industry realize, oh my God, we really ought, we really do want to have entertainment for young kids and, and middle-aged kids and, and adults, so we better do a rating system. So it crystallized it very quickly that this thing was needed 
And it also crystallized the need in everybody's mind to really support the ESA, which up to that point was only supported by Sega, Nintendo, Electronic Arts, uh, Activision, I'm not sure how many others, but it wasn't, it wasn't everybody. And soon after that, everybody got on board to support the Industry Association, which turned out to be a very good uh, both association for the members, but also for purposes of uh, lobbying in Washington. I noticed that on your Twitter profile, in the background of your picture, you have the framed millionth copy gold cartridge of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, and I'm sure you're very proud of that achievement. What are some of your proudest achievements um, during your time at Sega? What do you think were the biggest victories that you guys won were? Oh, clearly the biggest victory was was passing uh, Nintendo in, in share of market. Uh, I, I think that was really important. I think a lot of the stuff we did that didn't end up being that successful was also really, really important for the industry. You know, before you guys called, I was thinking about what the heck's the name of that guy who was president of AT&T, Bob something. And we did the first, he was in New York and I was at, uh, at CES in Las Vegas and we were doing, uh, or excuse me, I think I was at E3, E3 in Los Angeles and we were doing the first head to head racing game across telephone lines on Monaco GP. Uh, obviously there was a fair amount of latency in that, but we managed to pull it off and, and you know that that was the first time people had 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 really played a, a a game that had any kind of action in it across a telephone line coast to coast. So I think that was sort of kind of cool. And then I think the Sega Channel was really cool. Uh, you know, we we had uh, in the book I think they said we had 150,000 users. I thought we had 250, but anyway, uh, we had a lot of users for that time period that were paying 15 bucks a month to to have access to a variety of different games and changing them every month. And I think that was a precursor to, to uh, online gameplay also and, to, and also to subscription services for gameplay. So I think that was kind of important. Uh, the fact that we were the first to really do, uh, somewhat successfully anyway, optical disc games, media. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that was important. That The initial efforts, I mean, we had all these hype dreams. We thought we were going to be <laughs> combining you know, James Bond movies and, and, and animation and games and stereophonic uh, rock music and that this was going to be really neat. Didn't quite turn out that way, but it still was pretty cool. Uh, it's just that the initial efforts weren't weren't uh, weren't great. Night. Travels. Ooh, that was a That was a tough one. Did you ever see the interview where they they kind of uh, trapped me? They no. got me. They got me talking about on uh, good. It was either Good Morning America, one of the morning talk shows. Hmm. And in the background, which I couldn't see, they're playing Night Trap, and they've got the monsters grabbing young, attractive ladies in their <laughs> negligees and disappearing with them. And I'm talking about, hey, this is all tongue in cheek. It's not meant to be taken seriously. This is, a, you know, it's a game where the guys are really trying to save the girls and all this stuff. And in the background, they're showing all the guys grabbing these girls. So well, that's that TV sort of news that. for you. Yeah. You know? yeah. But you just you just mentioned, I mean, you've you've had a hand in a lot of first things. Like you've been a real pioneer in your time in the industry. And uh, one of them I want to talk about is Sonic Tuesday. The yeah. first almost the first almost global launch. Almost. Yeah. How how awful was that to coordinate? Oh my! Because I'm God. sure it it was a nightmare. You know, I don't know if you know the background of that. We we were very fortunate that uh, at that time we were in Redwood Shores, and hmm. in the building next to us was Emory Air Freight, and Don Moffat was the chairman of Emory Air Freight, and a guy named Dave Pearson, I think, was uh, the president, and uh, so we you know we'd have lunch together, and so we started talking about doing this together and initially, frankly, everybody thought it was impossible, but they really grabbed hold of it. And, uh, Dave Pearson and his, some of the other guys at Emory air freight really took the, the, the bull by the horns as they say, and, and figured out how to, how to, how to get this done to get a product to every store in the United States and Europe in the same time, uh, the same day, the same time. Um, it, it had never been done, you know, it was pretty, pretty amazing. 
And really, again, you know, Al was Al Nielsen was really pushing that really hard. And so, yeah, I mean, it took a whole it does. It's not one person. It takes a whole lot of people to get this kind of thing accomplished. And Al was good at that. And then Paul Rio and uh, Shinobu Toyota. I mean, these guys really uh, they had great people working for them and uh, managed to pull that off. I like that you mentioned your uh, development of all these big ideas. So Sega CD was obviously really the launching point for the next generation of consoles to use optical media, optical discs for their game media. You also mentioned the modem that you were working on with AT&T. For our listeners, that's called the Edge 16 modem, if you want to Google that. Um, yeah. One of, one of our readers had a question, which is, how come that never came to fruition? Or in Japan, Sega had what was called the MegaNet modem that allowed for some online functionality. Why didn't America get that, or why didn't the AT&T project come to fruition? Yeah, um, the the issue really was this that I was talking about. The latency was really tough. And, um, for example, in the game I was playing with uh, the CEO of AT&T, the latency was so bad that literally you had to stop your car and wait. For the other car to catch up so it kind of took the point away from mm-hmm. being able to do head-to-head uh racing in, the, in that particular game but the same thing was true in uh in other action games you know you, you you just you know how it is when you're playing a game and there's there's latency in the controllers i mean of course today they don't have those issues because the, the cpus are so strong but back in those days we used to have that issue even in some cartridge games you had latency but on uh um on trying to go across the telephone lines coast to coast, it was just not something we were able to overcome. So let's go down and talk a little bit more about your, your relationship with Sony, which seems like it was a very special relationship. You mentioned that yeah. that Sony actually funded about half the R&D on uh, developing Sega CD games because you guys both, you both your companies knew that this was uh, going to be the future. And then yes. there was the talk of a joint console. And you've also gone on the record saying that you were against the Saturn hardware coming to fruition. So you had some alternatives. You had this joint Sega Sony console. You had the chipset that would become N64. I think there was also the M2 console, which was never released, the sequel to 3DO. So what's the timeline on there? So walk (laughs) us through that. Can you walk us through that whole thing? Because it's very confusing. (laughs) Yeah, it's it. By the way, it's confusing for me now to think back at it. It, it seems Ew. like basically nobody wanted to play ball with Sony, so they yeah. they got off the leash and everybody was unemployed afterwards. Well, what? Yeah, that's right. I mean, Sony was supposed to do this deal with, uh, with at one point with uh, with with Nintendo, yeah. mm-hmm. and that fell through. And Nintendo went with uh, Philips, I believe. Philips, yeah, with Philips, mm-hmm. and so that really pissed Sony off. So. Uh, and I got had gotten to know Mickey Shuloff and uh, and Olaf Olafson a little bit, and we actually became very close uh, professionally and personally. I mean, I really really like Olaf. I, you know, he's a great guy. He, he's he's multi talented, uh, degree in physics, for, and also he's a great writer. You may not know this, but he's one of the best selling authors in Iceland. I think they mention it in the book. He really stands out, his yeah. chapters that are about yeah. him. But, yeah, I think they do mention his writing. Yeah, no, I tease him, though. I think being the best-selling author in Iceland is like being the best-selling author in San Mateo County. But, anyway, he is <laughs> he, 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 he writes very good, dark novels. Uh, and uh, and so we had, we had decided that we were, you know, Optical Disc was the future, so we were going to invest in it together. We were going to build these games, uh, and, and we did. And then we were working on the uh, the new platform together. We had some joint specs developed that we both from we both like. Now again, these specs were developed in from Joe Miller and from Olaf's guys. Uh, so when we went over to Japan, there is some reason to understand why uh, Sega wouldn't like it. You know, not invented here kind of issue. But Sony was willing to go along with the deal. It shows how how open and reasonable uh, they they were at the time. And of course, Sega of Japan turned that down. Uh, then uh, the Saturn effort was progressing at that same time. Joe Miller, my right so, arm. And so what R&D, year? What year is this approximately when this is happening? Um, that, that had to be about eighty four. I believe. 
Excuse me, 94. Yeah, I'm only a, only I was going to say, well, you really. Yeah, that's still that I'm at Mattel. Development hell, huh? You really were yeah. ahead of the game then, huh? Yeah, boy. <laughs> and, okay, but and anyway, 94, you said? Okay. Uh, yeah, 94, I think. And, and, and Joe was skeptical. What Joe wanted in the next hardware platform, uh, he wanted more. The Internet was coming along, and he was farsighted enough to see the importance of Internet connectivity and and play and, and he also uh, just didn't think the Saturn was a big enough step up from where we were so anyway um, at that time I coincidentally oh, excuse me sure. that's my phone coincidentally um, uh, I'd gotten to know Jim Clark who was chairman of Netscape uh, excuse me of Silicon Graphics at that time and Jim called me up and said gee we've got this great chipset that we've developed here and we think it's perfect for a video game system it was de developed by jen sun wang who by, who by the way now runs 3dx chairman of 3dx uh and and you know we think it's really good so we went over and looked at it and joe and i thought it was pretty spectacular and could graphically was better than what we were going to be able to do on in saturn uh we thought sound wise it was better as well so we invited uh, SOJ to come over, and uh, uh, Sato-san came over, and I, I think Nakayama himself came over. And uh, after a while, they said, no, the, the chip is too big, and it would be too, too hard to manufacture in quantity, and we like what we're doing better, so forget it. So that was, that was the end of that, and Clark called me and said, what do I do now? And I said, well, there's this other company up in <laughs> Seattle you might want to talk to and so he did and I, I think you probably know Jim ended up leaving Silicon Graphics and went on to be the founder of Netscape uh, years later so pretty talented guy um, anyway that's that story so where, where does the um, there was also talks of Sega licensing from uh, Panasonic the M2 hardware I don't know if yeah. that was before was that before or after Saturn no that was about the same time and uh, I actually we, we there we did we did some there was there are a few of those units that exist. Yeah. Uh, they were, and I don't know what happened with them and where they ended up, but I know they have existed. And uh, it's one of the few things that I don't have here at home. But uh, they were put in test, as I recall, uh, and it didn't it just didn't go well. And I think there was pricing issues as well. And then you mentioned one other one, by the way. You mentioned the 3DO possibility. Yeah. And that's true. We we had meetings in Japan with uh, with Trip Hawkins and uh, his right arm, whose name I forget right now. And we talked about the p possibility of should Sega do uh, a 3DO type of uh, of effort and combine with Trip on on that machine. And the and I was not I was not for that. Mainly again because of the complexity of the product and the and the cost. The cost was very high. Yeah, it launched at seven hundred dollars, but I actually didn't know that. I don't, I'm not sure that anybody knows that. I was oh. talking just about the M2, which was the sequel to 3DO. Oh. So oh. this might be new information. I thought world. you knew that. Oh darn! Here I go again, <laughs> saying things I'm probably under NDA not to say, but it's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, NDAs so are, it's not valid. They haven't found you yet. Yeah. Oh dear. Okay. Yeah, we had no. There was very serious discussion of that, though, and in in, uh, in 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 Tokyo, all of us went over there for meetings with Trip and and Nakayama and others. Wow, um, that's 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 brand new news to me. So I'm processing <laughs> that. And um, in the meantime, that all of this is happening, Joe Miller and wants to extend the life of Genesis with a two prong approach. Approach. It's going to be an add-on, which becomes the 32X that we got, and then what was called Project Neptune, which was going to be, I guess, replace the Genesis and just have the 32X built into it? Or would the Genesis yeah. have been sold alongside without the, that? Or would it have just replaced yeah. it? Yeah, actually, I think you got the order slightly wrong, though. I think, actually, SOJ suggested the Neptune first, okay. and Joe said, no, 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 let's take the guts out of the Neptune and make it an add-on to Genesis so that we keep Genesis alive longer. Um, so I think the order is a little bit backwards, but the idea, you're right. I mean, we ended up with uh, 
with 32X, which didn't turn out to sell very well. I, I got one for Christmas in 95, and I love it. Good. I've never, I got, I've never seen one. I've got so a couple it runs here, the by the way. Yeah. If you're ever out here, I've got in my basement, I've got, oh, I don't know, probably every game we ever made, almost. And If that's well, a real I'll, offer, I'll, I will promise you I will find a way to be out there. I'll, I'll send you my Christmas list, Rob. Uh, Al Nielsen loves coming here. Oh, man. <laughs> Let me tell man. you what, you're not that far from Phoenix. <laughs> So I got to ask with the, so with the 32 X though, do you feel that it was sort of like uh, one of the major problems that I, I didn't really see as a problem looking back now, but one of the major problems for the super Nintendo was it wasn't compatible with the original Nintendo entertainment system. And uh, it was sort of like a big dig that like you had to buy a new box was a, uh, were you guys sort of worried about having to, do the same song and dance and convince someone to buy a whole new system? Is that why sort of we yeah. saw add-ons with the CD and the 32X? That was, that was part of the thought process as well. And the other part of it was I was just desperate to keep try to keep Genesis alive longer and delay uh, Saturn, <laughs> frankly, longer. I, I mean, I think I was right on that, by the way. I still think there was a good market for a longer period of time than we were then able to enjoy for, for Genesis. Uh, 32X was one of the efforts to try to prolong that life. Uh, probably didn't help that much, but didn't work that much. But it, you know, it was at least we were, it was on the, the correct strategy, I think, to prolong the life of Genesis. Yeah, and I think that Nintendo vindicates you because they didn't come out with N64 until 96. So yeah. do you think that if um, the next gen Sega console held off till 96 too. that 32 X and Genesis would have continued to grow with that. Could that have been successful? Yeah. I, I, I think so. I think we would have been more successful. I think we, we, we certainly bottom line would have been more successful. I mean, the Saturn launch cost us a fortune. And, um, uh, and as you know, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. lots of problems. I mean, huge mm -hmm. problems pissed everybody off. Yeah. And that seems to be where Sega starts to unravel is the E3 where it was announced early. But, oh, yeah. But for you personally, where did you feel that your relationship with Sega began to fall apart? Oh, well, my relationship with Sega certainly had fallen apart by the time I was ordered to introduce Saturn at E3. Was that the moment? Uh, yeah. It, I mean, it, and then it, it all kind of, I, I really, I really realized then how, uh, how uh, how uh, bad that relationship was. Um, although Nakayama never acted, you know, in any way differently toward me. He just ordered me to do it, but he didn't. He didn't get angry with me. He never yelled at me. He never, you know, did all the things he did to his managers in Japan to me. I mean, he was always very nice to me and respectful. But clearly, the relationship had had uh, had soured by by yeah, that he was, point. He was kind of forcing your and, hand, really. And, 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 uh, and also what, I don't know if this comes across in the book or not, but you know, I had great relationships with retail in the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine what happened when all of a sudden we can't support all the major retailers who are my friends. And I've got to tell them, I'm sorry, you're not getting any of this product. There are people still today that were in senior management at, at places like KB, uh, stores where they won't talk to me because of that. Wow. I mean, it was a, a terrible situation for me personally. Yeah, I can imagine. So, so how did your exit from Sega go? How did? Well, it, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting too. That's the other strange thing about all this. So, I mean, I was I was fortunate enough. You remember uh, one of the things that uh, people don't don't know much about is we had been doing a bit using video game technology in the education sphere at Sega with yeah, the Pico, Pico product, the child computer. Mm -hmm. And, and we, I was really intrigued by this idea of, gee, you know, we video games are, are so interactive and so entertaining and so engaging. Why can't we do that with educational products? And of course I have six kids. So, and so many, one of them was just born at that time. So, you know, I was really into my, I was on the school board here. So I was really into education too. And, uh, and, uh, I really liked that idea of using video game technology. I still like it. Yeah. So I'm interested in, in Milken and Ellison are interested in using uh, technology to improve education. They form a company and I'm the only guy they know in common. So they, they hire me. 
or they make me an offer. And so that happened about the same time. So it was very fortuitous for me that I was able to resign from Sega knowing that I could go and do something that I really wanted to do. And so I did. I resigned. And strangely, uh, Nakayama and then this guy, Ira Majiri, asked me to, and I think I resigned in like April of that year. They asked me to stay on until September. And, you know, so I, I kind of talked with Milken and Ellis and said, gee, they really want me to stay on until September. I'm sort of surprised. And I still don't know why, by the way. Mm-hmm. So so anyway, I, it was I the stayed. opposite of it was the opposite of the Saturn. Yeah, yeah. Say, I quit now. No, we quit in September. It's it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so so because of my loyalty to my team, who are rapidly leaving the company, mm-hmm. <laughs> I I did I did stay on till uh, till September, and then and then joined with uh, Mike and Larry and formed what was originally called Education Technology. Later became Knowledge Universe. We funded Leapfrog. We funded a company called K Twelve. We we started it actually from scratch in our in our conference room we we started uh, knowledge beginnings and teacher universe and all these companies that were involved in using technology to improve education and so that took me away from video games although i still really love the idea of using video game technology to improve education so tom what are you up to these days <laughs> oh, oh man i'm still doing that stuff uh, I just I was involved. I was chairman of a company called Global Education Learning, that was involved in uh, education of young children in China, and we built it to be a reasonably successful company. And uh, a private equity firm just uh, offered us some money to buy it, and uh, my investors thought that was a good idea, so we we sold it to them. I'm still on the board of Leapfrog and trying to help Leapfrog recover. Leapfrog. Leaf, I, I stayed on. I was CEO of Leapfrog from '96 through basically 2005, and I stepped down in 2005, and uh, mainly because I had to work on dividing the assets at Knowledge Universe back to Larry Ellison and Mike Milken, and had to do some other things. And and uh, and so, I, but I stayed on the board of Leapfrog, and I'm still trying to help them. They've had a tough couple of years. I'm on the board of something called Cambium Learning Group which is all educational curriculum for kids with learning issues. And again, more and more of that is technology enabled and more and more of that is becoming uh, gamified. If you will, uh, yeah. if you ever want to look at some of this stuff, go to Cambium learning group owns something called explore learning out of Charlottesville, Virginia, and they gamify all sorts of interesting science principles and math principles and they're short little snippets that uh, will take you through a, a particular problem or a particular issue. Uh, they have one, I think, online if you want to understand how to put your digestive system together. It's really fun. Uh, we'll find that, and those links will be in the show notes, listeners. Oh, yeah, that, without a okay. doubt. Okay. And then uh, uh, they, another one of the companies is for you very young children helping them learn to read, and that's called Learning A to Z out of, uh, out of Tucson, Arizona. Uh, coincidentally, my hometown, oh. uh, really, really good company uh, being used by thousands and thousands of teachers where they, the claim to fame is present material to children that's timely and topical. So an example of that would be the the Pope is coming to uh, the United States next week. I think it's na- maybe say it later than that. But anyway, do a book for kindergartners, first graders, second graders, third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders on that to- topic because they're going to hear about it in the news and they're going to be interested in it and obviously have it level at the appropriate number of words and type of words for first graders through sixth graders. And actually they do three per grade level. So really, and it's all online, all online. So it's really cool stuff that, uh, that I'm involved in, uh, mostly using technology to improve education. And I'm on the board of a company called Junio, which is used, which was founded by the co-founder of Zynga, interestingly enough, Steve Shetler. And he was the big data guy. Mark Pincus was the marketing and product guy. And Steve Shetler uh, used big data there so that they could change games on the fly as they saw how users were playing them, what players liked, what they didn't like, give them more of what they like, obviously. Well, we're doing. he's trying to do the same thing with curriculum, personalized curriculum for children. 
so that if a child is learning math and he's really you find out he's really interested in baseball, you start presenting math in a baseball paradigm. If he's interested in dinosaurs, you present it in a dinosaur paradigm, that kind of thing. So that's what I'm involved in today. Well, I think that's wonderful. Um, that's huge. It's hugely I, important. I, I love you know. seeing – I have a 10-year-old. Um, I love seeing him on the computer. He's going to be so much smarter than me because I was – I was 18 before I got a computer. He, he's, he's grown up with them you know, his whole life. And in my, in my professional career, I do a lot of um, automated, online, customized learning. But not, not for kids, but for adults. But I, I think that this is the future. So I think it's just wonderful. I think it's a silver bullet. Thanks. I, I agree. Is to do we this. can do better. Yeah. Oh, oh my God! And, and really, I really think it's a lot of it is a technology solution. But that's a whole other, that's a whole other show. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's that's definitely the next level if there ever was one. Yeah, right. There we <laughs> go. Hey, let's use that line again. Welcome to the next hey, level. Yeah. Of education. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Use it. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about the book Council Wars. So, uh, Blake Harris got in contact with you. You did the book. It's a huge hit. It's a big seller. There's going to be a movie. First of all, how did it start? What was it like doing it? And were you surprised at how enamored the public is with this book? Yes and yes. I mean, first of all, I mean, I, I think Blake describes this or maybe maybe does it when you ask him the question. When he asked, talked to me about this, uh, what was it now, three years ago or something, he said, hey, I want to do a book on this period of time when you were CEO of Sega of America. And I said, geez, that's interesting, Blake. There's probably 200 people in the world that care. And he said, oh, no, 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 you're wrong. There's a huge number of people that care. And of course, it turned out he was correct. And and he did have to pursue me for a while to convince me of that. And then, you know, he's a he's got a great personality and he's a lot of fun to be with. And he came out here and spent a tremendous amount of time with me and my family uh, and my wife and, uh, and I spent a lot of time with him in New York. Uh, and, and, you know, it took months and months. And then the research he did was incredible. I mean, he found 200 people to at least to interview and he found all this archived materials to, to read and to put in the book. So, uh, it was a great experience as it turned out. I mean, this guy really, really worked hard to get this, to get this done. It shows definitely shows it's a great read i highly for anybody who hasn't read it i recommend it it's uh i mean if you if you haven't read it and you've listened up to this point we've ruined it for you but <laughs> no we haven't there's so but much read it more anyhow. The yeah oh the, yeah definitely we're only getting the sega side of the console war in this podcast yeah but there's yeah, so much more the, to it get the nintendo side in the book yeah. that's for sure well the other thing that has surprised me and you you may uh, uh, people who weren't involved in the video game business at all or in playing video games back in that time period seem to find it an interesting read. And I hear that over and over from people who contact me and say, gee, I, you know, this reads like a novel. I, I really found it interesting or I can't put it down. And that surprised me. And then the second thing that really surprised me, and you may not be aware of this, but I've been getting calls from a number of university professors who are using it as part of their uh, – business education classes. And sometimes it's an MBA class, sometimes it's another class, but uh, a number of universities have been calling about it. I haven't heard that, but I, it doesn't surprise me. It's fantastic. And let me just let me just say that all the things that you were trying to do in the book as I'm reading it, those worked on me. You know, I was a kid during that time. I was a Sega kid. I, I didn't know I only knew one guy in my neighborhood at Super Nintendo. So, and I, my parents were going to get me a Super Nintendo for Christmas, and I talked them out of it at the last minute. I don't want to Good for this. you. It's all because of, but it's because all this stuff that it's in the book, how the marketing and everything and the way it just connected with us. Um, yeah, it's, it's just amazing. I just got, I had to get that, that part out there. Oh yeah. And so you asked about the movie. There's actually two movies. Okay. The first movie, the first movie is the documentary right. and the documentary has been 100% filmed. They're still in in the final touches in the next couple of weeks of getting, uh, I hope of getting the, some animations done in it and different music and uh, some audio touch up and, uh, and obviously some more editing. And, and, uh, then hopefully the documentary will be, will be finished. And, uh, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg and Scott Rudin and obviously Blake Harris will start uh, figuring out how to distribute it, whether that goes to a theatrical distribution or a 
you know, a TV uh, history channel or PBS or some other kind of, of, of viewing of it. I don't know. I don't know that business that well. And then the feature film. And by the way, in the documentary, you get to see me. Yeah. And, and oh, oh, yeah, that's, and that's you get to see all those, all those horrible Nintendo people. You get to <laughs> see them. And you know what? They've really aged. But I look the same. Yeah, you look great. <laughs> yeah. We can see you. Our, our listeners won't be able to see you. But, Tom, you look like you're 50 again. <laughs> Thanks, man. You're welcome, uh, sir. But anyway, so that documentary will soon be uh, available for, for viewing. The feature film, my understanding, is Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg are still writing it, and Scott Rudin's obviously agreed to produce it, and it's still on the Sony uh, to release. Sony's agreed to distribute it on, the, on their schedule for, I believe, 2017. Uh, as you know, Seth and Rogan are very busy. I just read in some magazine today that they're doing a uh, um, a movie on the the preacher. You know the yeah. preacher from uh, mm-hmm. DC Comics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I I don't know who's playing the preacher, but anyway, uh, they're working on that right now. So obviously, that interrupts their writing of the mm-hmm. feature script and the feature film script is going to be difficult because they've got to condense Blake's book down to a couple hundred pay a couple oh, hundred. It's a huge book. It spans years. Yeah. So, so I to so get it down into two hours. As I was yeah. reading it, I was wondering like, okay, are we going to see this? Are we going to see this scene? Is this going to be the picture I'm going to see? But uh, it's, it's hard to pull out what, what is actually going to happen to make it like a two hour narrative. But uh, I, I know that they'll do a great job with it because it's a great story. Something everyone who loves retro games should, you know, check out at least once. Yeah, you know? I agree with you. Tom, who do you want to play you in the movie? Ha, ha, ha. You know, I, I don't dare say who I want to have play me because I'm sure then it wouldn't <laughs> happen. Uh, but my daughters think that it 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 it, it should be, uh, oh, come on, Tom. Uh, uh, Cooper. Bradley Cooper. Oh, Bradley Cooper. Okay. See, I was thinking more like Brad Pitt, but I can see Cooper. <laughs> uh... I, I got to ask. So with, with all the media attention now with this and for the, the story, the book, the documentary, now maybe the, the movie and all this, did you ever think that your your career and your life would be so prolific that it would be shared with uh, such an audience? Not just the things that like you, the products you've marketed and the, you know, the business, but you know, your story. Did you ever think you'd be out there for people? No, no. <laughs> I st- and I still find it very strange to tell you the truth. I, no, I, ne- I never did. Uh, but, I, but I must say when I, when, I, when I look back on the things I've done, I, I'm just really happy that uh, people enjoyed it. You know, people enjoyed the, the products that I've been involved in, whether that was Masters of the Universe or Hot Wheels or Matchbox or Sega or Sonic or or leapfrog, uh, you know, so I, I'm very grateful to, for, for that. Okay. Um, we have a couple of reader questions. So let's get to a really good one here is what was the best moment during your career at Sega? And was it Sonic Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I still think while I loved Sonic Tuesday, cause it was so damn difficult to do back then. I think the greatest moment was when the um, NPD people uh, walked in and, and said, by the way, you passed Nintendo and share of market this month. Uh, and so t- to me, that was that was a heck of an accomplishment. And, and the team really, really celebrated. We really celebrated that. We celebrated a lot of things. You know, we also celebrated failure. Did you ever hear about that? Let's hear it. <laughs> We used to celebrate the best failure that was really a good idea, but it just didn't work. And we'd either give a hundred dollar check or something stupid. And to senior management, I would give a, a yellow rubber check. And... <laughs> so Paul Rio got a lot of yellow rubber chickens. <laughs> what are what are some examples? The yellow rubber chicken examples. Oh, you know when. When he, a lot of times it was things like he'd fall in love with Paul was such a curmudgeon guy, you know, he, Vietnam vet, uh, tough guy. I've known him half my life. I knew him at Mattel. I, I've, you know, I've, I've 
I worked with closely at Sega, and then I brought him into Leapfrog to straighten out operations there. Uh, so sometimes he wouldn't listen to marketing or market research or the opinion of sales, and he'd decide a game was really good, and he'd order like 500,000 cartridges to be made, to manufactured, and we'd sell like 200,000. So he got a few rubber chickens for those <laughs> kinds of decisions. And probably a basement full of games. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next question is, um, it was announced at a convention, I'm not sure which one, that Sega was coming out with this virtual reality helmet called the Sega VR. Um, oh, yeah. What's the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the true story behind that? Yeah, uh, there's a couple different VR products that we, that we worked on. Um, one of them was from, um, the, it was a subsidiary, I believe of Boston scientific, and it was a, a, uh, red led that spun off of a mirror and created a 3d virtual world. We uh, turned that down and Nintendo did it. And it was, what was the name of that Nintendo the vir product? The virtual, virtual boy, boy. virtual yeah. boy, virtual boy. And I think we were right in turning it down. The, yeah. the second one was a more more like the VR that's being done today, but imagine the technology of the of the 90s. And it was a helmet, and it was pretty cool. I mean, you would you could uh, put it on, and literally you were in a in a virtual world, and it moved as you moved your head, and uh, you had to find uh, objects and weapons and uh, destroy enemies and what have. You. And it was it was really neat. The problem, though, was that there were a couple. There were a lot of problems. Uh, but one of the problems was almost everybody got sick. Huh. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. It caused severe motion I... sickness, and and other people would get like severe headaches from it because of the the way the lights are flickering inside the mm -hmm. helmet. And and so you know we went quite a ways with that, and then ended up uh, not doing it because we couldn't we couldn't be making people sick. Do you Obviously. have one in your basement? No, <laughs> that one I don't have. Good, good comment. Yeah, I should have taken that. <laughs> Daniel. Yeah. You, your next question, sir. Oh, my next question. I mean, geez, it's more of a comment. I'm not because it's not really a question, but I got to just say, and I mean, I, I hate to be, you know, the gusher, but I got to say, the decisions you made at Sega shaped my entire life as a gamer because I started with Genesis. Oh, well, that's great to hear. And I, I started, I got a bundle with Sonic 2. So I was a little after Sonic Tuesday, but nevertheless, I came in, you know. And I mean, to this day, I, I don't have a Super Nintendo. I mean, I got a lot of Nintendo stuff, but that generation is all, for, for me, the nostalgia with Sega. Yeah. You know, so oh, that, a lot that's of... That's great to hear a lot of things and i mean it's it just it just shaped the whole attitude i had with with gaming you know i always sort of had that that sega root and i think it sort of came from you know like the sega scream you know sega exactly <laughs> just it was it's is it's sort of like a i think a lot of what you did was you set the the pace and you set the atmosphere so different from what nintendo was doing and you sort of really made it a competitive field where we, we didn't really have that before. And it, it, you sort of like, you know, you drew the line in the sand. And yeah. for a lot of kids my age, a lo half of the fun wasn't just playing the games, but being really loyal to the box that you played because we yeah. couldn't always afford every box. It's a different game now, but you still see that, you know? And I mean, even even to this day, like with, with, with Dreamcast now, which just, I think it was yesterday, was the 16th anniversary of the Dreamcast, but... Sweet 16. But I mean, I and you said this before early on, but the, there are so many IPs with Sega that, that they're not utilized today. And it's, it's, a, it's a damn shame because there's so many great games that, you know, you guys had them and I had them and I, you know, I, I'm, I have to go back to stay with them. You know what I mean? Yeah. The house that you built, people still knock on the door. And I think that that is special, more special than anything you could really you know, buy or something you could try to sell. Great thing to say. I, I you know, I really am uh, honored that you're saying that. And, and uh, I certainly never expected it, by the way. I mean, mm. completely, un, un, completely unexpected. 
But I, and I also think, though, there's one other thing that people miss out on, this whole notion that uh, playing video games, that for a long time people were saying playing video games isn't, isn't good. Playing video games has turned out to be great for people. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's really gotten uh, uh, people interested in technology. A lot of the people that played the video games back in those days are, are really using technology better today than ever, ever before. Kids got more interested in it, and today are engineers and inventors and developers. And like we were talking earlier, it's also everybody's talking about, gee, let's make education as much fun as a video game. Well, damn right. So, you know, I think it was really, it's really uh, important what we, what we did back then. And I certainly didn't realize it at the time. That's a lot of different perspectives. So how do you, how do you feel? I mean, you built this company and then after you left, it kind of basically imploded. How did you feel watching that as the person who was responsible for its greatness and then not a part of it anymore and could do nothing to stop it? Yeah. Uh, well, well, the one fortunate thing for me was I was so, so busy on Knowledge Universe and LeapFrog and and other the other Knowledge Universe companies, K-12 and Knowledge Beginnings and Teacher Universe and and uh, uh, the other companies you wouldn't know the name of uh, so much, but uh, one called Spring in the UK that was an IT training company that I didn't notice initially for the first few years. I mean, 97, 98, 99, 2000, probably right through 2001, I didn't really notice what was going on that much. Wow. And then when I finally did start noticing, you're right, it was a disaster. What the heck is going on? And even today, I mean, I, Al and I talk frequently and and a lot of former Sega people, we, we get together and talk and uh, – it's hard to understand how this could have imploded and gone downhill as fast as it has. And everybody says, well, Tom, you ought to, you ought to go over to Japan and tell Satomi he's got to change. And he's got to do things differently. <laughs> yeah, well, come on. He's not, they're not going to listen anymore. I don't think, I think that's, it's too, it's gone too far. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what Sega's future could possibly hold for it at, at this point. So the next, but our next, our next reader question is, Genesis versus Super Nintendo. In the end of that race, who won? <laughs> well, you know, if you if you look at all the research where we did the head-to-head -head comparison playing, and we generally tried to stack the deck with Mario lovers, and if they played both systems head-to-head, -head, one after the other, we always got 80% of the preference. So I, I think uh, in that sense, we were, we were better. Now, obviously, Nintendo had a, a huge uh, business and a huge company and a lot of folks loyal to it. So uh, in the end, I guess they outsold us in total hardware units. But we certainly beat them uh, in the mid-90s. Uh, we were outselling them uh, pretty well. You beat them in the time that it counted to beat them. Yeah, I think so. If you were given the opportunity to take – another fledging company like that and launch into a global brand, would you do it today? Would I do the same thing today? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely would. Now, today's market is so different and, and I'm not, frankly, I'm not up on it. You know, I'm not up on how huge Steam has become and, and uh, you know, I'm certainly not up on the, the current technologies. I see my 17-year-old son and my 21-year-old son playing video games here and I know they're playing online and they're playing against a huge number of other people it seems to me uh, and, and and I'm glad they are uh, uh, but it's you know I, I, I'd have to relearn the business to make a company successful today in the video game marketplace because I'm out of it I don't understand it any longer but you could do it I could do it <laughs> <laughs> there you go. a lot of people you know look at Sega CD as like this failure or whatever but do you think if Sega CD didn't exist, that PlayStation or Sega Saturn could have existed? Um, eventually, but I think it would have taken a lot longer be, because everybody learned so much from the Sega CD experience. Uh, there were so many tricks we had to learn uh, in, in, that, in, in putting video games on an optical disc um, that without that, I think it would have been uh, at least a five-year delay from... Uh, from the current the, the launches that occurred back then. 
so the R and D of you and Sony and the third party developers learning how to make a game for Sega CD really sped up the the R and D pro, uh, the development oh, process. Oh, oh, sure. I mean, we were working very closely with the the what was the Sony group down in uh, Santa Monica? Um, imagine I, I, uh, ImageSoft. Yeah, ImageSoft. And of course, we were working with Digital Pictures and uh, and others. And then of course, a lot of those people who learned how to who learned the lessons that we learned on Sega CD went to other companies uh, where they were able to speed the process up of, of optical uh, uh, media and, and putting games on optical media and making them worthwhile. Yeah. Actually, one of the guys from Digital Pictures formed a little company called Planet Web and made a web browser for Sega Saturn. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think Mike, Mike Latham went out and did a lot of great things too. So you know, there's, a, there's a group of them. That were Ed, Ed and Anziata. There are a group of them that were very successful. So Nintendo had Nintendo Power, which was in newsstands and everywhere. But you guys had Sega Visions. Why do you think that Sega Visions never had the same level of traction as um, Nintendo Power? Well, I think we, you know, obviously we we started later, and the world was uh, pretty Nintendo centric at the time. Uh, we had fair traction, I would say, with with our Sega magazine. Um, <clears throat> it was pretty good. We probably didn't spend as much on it as we as we should have, but all in all, it was pretty good. It, it served its it served its purpose. And then, of course, today's world, every nobody uses magazines anymore. Everything is 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 online. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really kind of hard to. My my son, for example, like I have a few of the old ones in the house, and he's he's like, oh, how did you know how to do the codes? How did you know the moves? It's like, oh, you had to go buy this book. <laughs> you had to actually get this thing. Like, oh my god, how do you search it, Daddy? <laughs> <laughs> By turning the pages. Seriously, I love it. Um, what's the best game on Sega Genesis? Oh, I'm you know I'm I'm with Daniel. I I think it's Sonic too. I, I think that's the best game we yeah. we did. Now, personally, I also love playing sports games, even though by today's standards they're you know they're pretty hokey. But geez, I I loved uh, both Montana football and Madden football, and uh, NBA basketball and uh, NBA uh, and uh, NBA basketball and NBA uh, baseball and. Uh, and, I, and, and and even the golf games. I mean, so I, I enjoyed all of our sports games, too. You know, regarding Sonic 2, there's one thing that I just wanted to clarify for myself. So Yuji Naka, actually, was he actually, did he actually quit Sega when you hired him at STI? Or was he still kind of an employee? Because that's a really big coup. He had pretty much quit Sega Japan. And Shinobu Toyota saved him by offering him the STI experience and uh and and you know and then he came over here and and lived in in, uh in northern california and worked out of uh as it wasn't in redwood city it was actually in palo alto uh, um with his team that with his team there and with uh roger hector and mark cerny mark cerny of course is now famous today we're doing a lot of work with uh sony heading up uh sony development and so he, you know, it was a really interesting group. He brought in uh, his 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 compatriots from Japan, and then we had some really talented guys working with him, like Mark Cerny. So it was a very very good team. I like the I like the phrase STI experience. I think that if anyone <laughs> should ever have the idea to do a Sega theme park, it should be called that. <laughs> oh, I don't I don't know about that. Uh, another thing about Sonic too, I don't know if you're aware, but this month it's actually supposed to be re-released as a Sega 3D classic. For the the Nintendo 3DS, so this is gonna be the first I time. I didn't know that. No, we're, I didn't know that. Oh well, they've been re-releasing a lot of the older uh, Sega Genesis and Sega arcade games as a uh, as 3D classics. I believe the developers M2, and they're they're meticulous in how the, how the, they don't port it. They they I they like eyeball every element in the game and they put it back in twice to make it 3D. Huh. So the original Sonic is already out. Um. But this month we are we're getting uh, Sonic the Hedgehog two in three D, 
And uh, I, I'm excited to see it because, you know, it's my favorite game. But, I mean, it's it's going to be a whole new way to see it. And it's, it's a blast that, like, even nowadays, you know, with, with you can still get Sega Classic games, you know, and you can get them in new ways and interesting ways. And they're not just uh, odd ports, you know. It's it's like this, the 3D Classic is built from the ground up to be a, a really, um, like, the authentic edition of it, you know. It's not like we're just processed through an emulator, you know. Huh. Well, you know, I, I've never had a Nintendo product in my house, but you may be <laughs> talking me into buying a. a well, it's, it's a portable, so you can leave it in the car. Okay. You know, there you go. You know, not not to break any rules, you know, of the house here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, <laughs> it's, that's, that's other stuff we're learning. We're now we're getting all this exclusive. Well, is there any closing thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Well, uh, yeah. The only closing thought is, I mean, I'm I'm just really both surprised and honored at how big the retro gaming market, and I think that's really the wrong word for it, but the, the folks who grew up in the 90s and played Sega Genesis games, I'm really surprised and gratified that there's so many that still love those products and want to talk about them and want to play them. Uh, I think it's just absolutely wonderful. I, I wish that we were able to keep that, great Sega IP alive in the United States and in Europe. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, that boat has sailed, unfortunately. But I personally am just very grateful for it. I uh, uh, love talking about it. And thanks to you guys for, for doing such a good job and keeping that interest level up and, and uh, really reporting on it. Thank you for yeah, the gift the, you gave me in my childhood. Yeah. Yeah, giving, us something to, giving us something to talk about in the first place. And I mean, this is going to go beyond bef beyond us, too. Yeah. Uh, Rob, you just did a, a retro living room where you had a, a lot of uh, Sega games out for, for a younger audience just to see and experience maybe the first time hands-on. And they, even today, the, young, the youngsters are, are really engaged with these old games, and they're, they're still uh, being captured by the magic that's the Genesis, you know? It's... It's definitely not just us 90s kids. Even my 10-year-old loves to play Sonic the Hedgehog 1, 2, and 3. Oh, that's great. That is, that is terrific. Tom, thank you so much for Thank you, guys. Oh, man, great, it's it's great been an absolute pleasure. All right. All right. Sega! Sega!